Good day everyone, uh, it's Gravy here. My name is Jock Ludic. I'll be talking about ethical aspects of artificial intelligence within healthcare and clinical context in the smart technology era. So my massive transformative purpose is around shaping a better future in the smart technology era. I also wrote a book called Democratizing Artificial Intelligence to Benefit Everyone, where this is also a subtitle. In the book, I do discuss uh, various AI applications in healthcare, personalized medicine, personalized education, etc. But also talking about uh, the future of AI and where things are going. So what we see here is a, a diagram where on the y-axis we see business value, on the x-axis we see time, and we see how business value has been unlocked via agriculture, fishery, metals over time. And you can see on top of that the impact of the four industrial revolutions, industrial and the financial sector. And then since 1995, we can see the internet era's impact as part of the information revolution and the data generation that's been exponential. And that's pretty much been the feeding ground for the AI era, which I call also the smart technology era, because it's really the fusion of multiple technologies that we see at play. And the speed of technology change is incredible. We can see the various exponential technologies, which have included blockchain here, biotech, neurotech, nanotech, um, 3D printing, AI, robotics, drones, etc. But it's this, the fusion of these kind of technologies that's making incredible impact. And we see the linear to exponential growth trajectory. This is another way of looking at the smart technology era along different dimensions. So at the bottom here, you can see industry 1.0 up to industry 4.0, where it's going from steam and water power mechanization to electricity, mass production, and the assembly line, and computers and automation with industry 3.0, the information era. And we were sitting now is cyber physical systems, and we call it the industry 4.0. But you also see society progressing over time as well. So you can see society 1.0 all the way to society 5.0, where we starting off with hunting and gathering society, the agricultural society, the industrial society, information society, and we label ourselves now as a smart society. And you can also then, on top of that, look at web. So web 1.0, which is all about read, um, that really started way back, effectively. Web 2.0 is about read and write, and then Web 3.0 is read, write, execute, or read, write, own. And then you can look at it from um, the, the top level here is thinking about biological brute strength, animals, basic tools, and over time you see natural wind, water, steam, power being utilized. Then we see our tools like computers helping with cognition and memory, and then cybernetics is all about the fusion of human and machine. So that all constitute the smart technology era, which is a new era. And the, the promise here is actually also to create a smarter world, where we see real-world AI, smarter apps, automation, and you see smart cities, smart grids, smart homes, smart cars, smart devices, smart logistics, smart retail, smart construction, smart farming, smart healthcare, uh, which obviously we will be talking about here. But we also need to be careful. We do live in extremely dangerous times, and I think we need to think on our feet. We need to be first principles thinkers, um, thinking about the foundations of what we do, the philosophy of what we do is super important, and, and, and I also think it's incredibly important to help shape that better future for all of humanity. That should always be in the back of our mind. In my book, I also talk about the current civilization trajectory, which is problematic. Uh, we, we do struggle with sense-making, meaning-making, uh, there's wealth gaps, uh, job loss, catastrophic risk, discrimination, data abuse, bias, human agency, dependence, lock-in, institutional decay, disorder, and destabilization of society. We see a little bit of aspects of this. It is not as bad right now, but the trajectory is, is problematic. Um, so we do need visionary leadership, collective sense making wisdom, and practical actions to ensure that humanity and our civilization is moving in the right direction. 
as we work towards unlocking the, the incredible potential that we have with AI and other smart technologies. So we know that AI's impact on society is tremendous. There's been a lot of talk about this, obviously with the arrival of generative AI, where the public has experienced AI in that fashion as well with ChatGPT and large language models. We can see that it's already affecting our productivity. It, it's affecting the effort and time we take to complete daily tasks. Um, I've been using some of these kind of tools. It's definitely helping my productivity. Uh, even the way we search for information or tap into knowledge bases, that's been changed as well. Um, our understanding of complex problems, how they fit together. So these kind of AI or AI in general can also help us with that. Also understanding the brain and what intelligence is. Um, things like privacy, transparency, and ethic is obviously being affected. We have to be very mature and smart about this. Think about what's in the best interest of humanity, society, civilization. Um, and it's, it's really omnipresent. Um, and I think we, we see quite a bit of products and processes, tools. It's almost like the Wild West. And we see quite a bit of these kind of technologies being utilized to help improve, enhance, reinvent, and, and actually disrupt our lives. We also know that digitization or digital literacy um, is, is probably one of the largest separators right now. So it's very important to democratize AI, to democratize AI-enabled education, and all of these kind of things as well. So there are benefits and risks um, associated with AI. Some of the potential benefits for society and social good obviously include uh, producing new efficiencies and enhancing human capacities. Um, we know it can op optimize and augment people's lives. Um, we we have obviously will be talking about the ethical considerations around healthcare. It is, healthcare is one of the big major application use cases for artificial intelligence and smart technology. It's also affecting work and also the future of education, which needs to be disrupted, in my opinion. Um, but there's also risks. And uh, for me, the danger is around digital dictatorship, um, state surveillance, capitalism. Um, if you think about um, human agency, it's very important that we have a look at that and don't um, have dependence lock-in as well. We have to look at the, the potential um, of job loss. Um, or the automation of tasks within jobs, so we need to adapt very quickly. Uh, we know the problems around bias, so data abuse is important, and we also don't want mayhem. So we still need um, structure, uh, structure and order in civilization. Um, so it's very much things that we have to look at and see how AI and smart technologies can be navigated in, in the best possible way. So there are potential harms for, from algorithmic decision-making. Um, there are uh, collective social harms, but there's also individual harms. Uh, and in this particular slide, um, on the left-hand side, we see individual harms and we see illegal discrimination and unfair practices. Um, and then you see the loss of opportunity uh, around hiring, employment, insurance, social benefits, housing, education. That could all be individual harms. On a collective social harm level, you see a loss of opportunity, but this is how it affects individuals. And then on the social, uh, collective social harm, we see economic loss as well, but on the individual level, it's things like credit or differential prices of goods, just based on who you are. And then also social stigmatization, um, which is obviously collective social harm. And there on the individual level, we see it play out as loss of liberty or increased surveillance or stereotype reinforcement or dignitary harms. Those are all things that we have to be very careful. And if we think about um, how to address these kind of things, maybe before I get to that as well, just important to look at the key requirements for trustworthy AI. Now trustworthy AI is really ethical AI, robust AI and lawful AI. And we think about the foundations of ethical AI, it's about autonomy, no harm, fairness, and explicability. So you need to explain things. So if you look at the key requirements, there are seven uh, being identified by various groups, also by the European Union, uh, also the partnership on, on AI. And the first one is human agency and oversight. Second one is around technical robustness and safety. Then also, very important, privacy and data governance. Transparency is the fourth one. 
Then we all know about diversity, non-discrimination and fairness. We want inclusion, that is, that is very important. And then the sixth one here is societal and environmental well-being. We have to think about the impact of trustworthy AI on that. And the last one is around accountability. So these are the key requirements for trustworthy AI. Um, and there are solutions to address AI's anticipated negative impacts. Um, I think the first one is around improving human collaboration across borders and stakeholder groups. It's clear that the dangers that we face is, is across borders, it's global. Um, you think about nuclear or viruses, and you think about lethal autonomous weapons. Um, we need collaboration. There's no way other way. And then we can also develop policies to assure that development of AI will be directed at augmenting um, humans and the common good. So it's all about values-based systems. And the final one here is around shifting the priorities of economic, political and education systems to empower individuals. If we want to build a human-centric um, future that's compassionate but also utilizing the benefits of smart technology, we have to empower individuals and to stay ahead in the race with the robots. And maybe it shouldn't be a race. We should maybe have a dance where we really collaborate. It's human plus AI. So if you think about the journey um, on the man-machine intelligence continuum, this is being portrayed by PwC, and I think it do make sense, where you see assisted intelligence, and you see also evolving into augmented intelligence. We see a lot of that. But we will also see big market around autonomous intelligence. As the AI intelligent agents become smarter, we'll see more applications in augmented and autonomous intelligence. So the future of AI, we can add many dimensions here. I've added uh, a human-centric dimension where you can see compassion needed versus compassion not needed. On the x-axis, we've got optimization going this way. So it's obviously man, uh, mundane tasks, routine tasks that can be optimized versus in this direction it's all about creativity or strategy etc. But then if you do it like this you've got four quadrants and you can see in this particular quadrant where AI, assisted intelligence, autonomous intelligence, where compassion is not needed can really take this space. When you move to, cre to the creativity st uh, strategy, strategic side you see more kind of the augmented intelligence where you've got AI and human plus AI. When we move above the x-axis here, um, you do see AI with the warm embrace of humans um, because compassion is needed. We want it to be, be more human-centric. So we can see a bunch of uh, jobs or tasks that uh, are that kind of level. And then on the right top corner, we see more kind of humans at play, uh, even though AI can assist with creativity and, and strategy and optimization. When we talk about compassion and human centricness, um, we, we do see a, a big future for humanity to play in this quadrant. So what is AI? Um, very briefly, it's, it's the capacity for a machine to reason, perceive uh, information, it could be data as well, to solve uh, problems, to optimize, prioritize, reach conclusions. So effectively, it's the cognitive processes of machines. So it's got the ability to learn, recognize, analyze, and make decisions. And obviously with machine learning, we learn it learns it from data as well, um, and it learns it from sensor information, just as we do as humans. We, we also learn what we observe in the world. Another definition is around achieving specific goals through flexible adaptation in ways that humans do. Um, so there you want to maximize the chance of successfully achieving goals. And with generative AI, which is a subset of artificial intelligence and, and a subset of deep learning and machine learning, we, we see applications around generating new unique data or content that is similar to the data it was trained on. So it's like self-supervised learning, what we effectively see. Um, and this is just some examples. So here is an example of where a neural network or machine learning AI is doing facial recognition and is really taking it through layers similar to our cognitive visual system, um, the vis visual system in the brain, where it's maybe taken, take, looking at a picture, but then detecting edges, and then it goes through higher levels of abstraction in a non-linear way, where it's putting edges together, you see noses and eyes, and then that could be built together as a face, and it can, it can start recognizing faces. So you see a lot of these kind of things as well. 
So AI applications in healthcare and life sciences, there are so many. Um, on the left, you see some applications, uh, diagnosis of diseases, medical image diagnosis, drug discovery, personalized medicine, um, medical robots, um, uh, electronic health records, clinical trials, outbreak prediction, so you can look at it more broadly. Um, and I've bracketed things, put this into some categories, some of the applications. So you think about hospitals, real-time diagnostic data analysis, personalized treatment plans, uh, patient care quality and program analysis, uh, virtual nursing assistance. You can get a range of um, assistance, intelligent virtual assistance, improved health outcomes, and robot-assisted surgery. So those are so just some of the applications. And then on the drug discovery development front, there's quite a bit of things that you can do to expedite the, de uh, the development of drugs, uh, also the discovery of drugs, so it's actually helping with research and development. Um, and then there's a range of applications around health insurance, medical schemes, um, healthcare businesses, um, where you see health insurance claims related fraud detection, growth and retention of medical scheme members. Um, the typical things that you also see with other consumer-facing businesses, um, and then in businesses, administrative workflow assistance, business process automation, value chain optimization, um, campaign and sales program optimization, brand and rotation management. Um, so it's really all of these kind of things uh, where you can unlock value. And we, we've been doing uh, various things also in this space, more in the wellness space. So here is an example of AI driven wellness companion, Vive Teens, that won the World Economic Forum Youth Mental Health Award last year, as one amongst others, representing Asia and Africa. Um, and basically what we have here is a system that can discover content that is AI curated for, in, curated for individual. You've got an AI assistant that's there 24 seven, and always able to assist, but you also have the counselors, human counselors, that you can communicate with via um, like a WhatsApp type of uh, functionalities, like a platform uh, where you can chat uh, as well. So real world companions. Um, Journey Wellness is an example of an ultra personalized wellness coach. It's not only looking at uh, mental wellness, but it's looking at other aspects as well. Um, here we see, for instance, healthy eating and diet, exercise and fitness, mental health, health and chronic lifestyle diseases being identified. And it's utilizing a range of data as well around um, just the human interactions with the app, but also health profile and survey data, wearable data, third party wellness data. You can bring in claims data um, uh, from medical schemes, employee data. And all of that could be utilized to create a holistic 360 degree view well, of this individual from a wellness perspective, which all leads to healthier people, healthier employees, and better lives. Okay, so what are the potential benefits and risks of using AI in clinical research? So I've bracketed things here so you can see the benefits. Um, I think, first of all, enhanced data analysis that we can already get with traditional machine learning where you see rapid processing and analysis of vast data, identification of critical patterns and, and predictive analytics as well. Um, but also we see improved efficiency and accuracy. So you can really speed up your research processes, for instance, if you think about clinical research. Or you can think about increased diagnostic accuracy. That's another uh, efficiency, um, accuracy type of improvement. Then cost reduction. Um, if you start automating various mundane routine things, tasks, you can also reduce operational costs. Um, it could also help you with faster drug discovery. We know there's quite a bit of money that's spent in terms of drug discovery and development, and there are plenty of opportunities to fast track that. Um, personalized medicine is a big one. You can have tailored treatment plans, enhancing outcomes, and then also early detection and prevention. Um, we want uh, healthcare, not sick care, preferably. So early dis disease detection through real-time data analysis. And then drug discovery, development, efficient analysis of biological data, enhanced clinical trials, efficient patient recruitment, and real-time monitoring. So there are a range of benefits. And this is not exhaustive. There are more. But there are also risks. So one big one is around data privacy. So, and security challenges in handling sensitive health data is, is incredibly important. Um, then algorithmic bias. 
uh, that we also see in many other industries and applications. But it's also important right here with in healthcare and clinical research and within the clinical context. Because the risk of bias and unfair treatment due to unrepresentative training data is a problem. The other big problem is around interpretability and explainability. I think as humans we would like to understand a, a diagnosis, uh, a prognosis, um, a specific treatment. So if we've got black box systems that go, don't give us that, that's problematic. So there are work being done to, to really help and assist with uh, explanations. Uh, we also need to be careful uh, about over-reliance in AI, especially now when AI is still more immature. Oh, there is in fact a danger of incorrect predictions impacting clinical decision makings. If you think about even the likes of ChatGPT um, and potential hallucinations, uh, one needs to be careful. The other thing is regulatory compliance, um, evolving uh, regulatory landscape, creating compliance challenges. Um, so so that, that is something that one needs, needs to look at. Um, integration challenges. Uh, we obviously have existing healthcare IT infrastructure, and the question is, um, how do you integrate um, AI uh, with, with that kind of infrastructure? And then also resource intensive. Uh, so some of these, especially large language models, generative AI models, we talk about uh, trillions of parameters, um, really high computational resources, expertise is also required. And then there's a question about potential job displacement. If we think about um, the current jobs that's there, so we obviously need to adapt very quickly. So there are concerns over automation, replacing human jobs or tasks within jobs. Uh, we need to be responsible and very agile in addressing that. So those are some of the risks. Um, if we think about PR, South Africa's Protection of Personal Information Act, um, there are some key requirements and, um, and then also we can look at things from an ethical consideration perspective. Um, if we think about the PR specifically, this is some of the key requirements listed. So the first one is around accountability, um, ensuring organizational responsibility for personal data. Um, then also processing limitations. We have to make sure that um, data processing is, is necessary, it's minimal and it's legitimate. We also need to think about uh, the purpose, so we need to specify it. You need to say what are the defined lawful purpose for data collection, why are you collecting this particular data. And then any further processing limitations, uh, we have to make sure about compatible processing with the initial collection purpose. So if you think about how data is being used downstream, you've got to be very careful. Information quality, um, this is PIA requires data accuracy and completeness. Also an openness, we need to inform the data subjects uh, on data collection and the use. Um, there also need to be security safeguards in implementing measures to protect personal, uh, personal data. And then also data subject participation, we need to allow access and correction of data by the individuals, by the data subjects. So if they need to change something which is maybe not now correct anymore because life is dynamic, things change over time, that should also be possible. Then notification of security compromises. Um, we have to notify authorities and subjects on data breaches. Um, operator processing. We need to govern the processing by operators or representatives. So the whole process, even internal, external, and, uh, needs to be governed. And then when you look at cross-border information transfers, this is obviously where Papier kicks in quite a bit because it's about ensuring protection during cross-border data transfers. And then last one is around prior uh, authorization where we need to obtain authorization before processing in certain cases. Okay, so those are in a nutshell the key requirements from an AI ethical consideration perspective and you can see how it dovetails with Papia informed consent. It also comes out of, uh, from, from Papia as well, one of the key requirements. Privacy and data security, critical, also comes from there. Algorithmic bias, transparency and accountability, and fairness and equity. Those are things that we have to take super serious and uh, be responsible about. Now we can ask the question, how do PAPIA and ethical requirements apply to the use of AI in clinical research? Now, if you go through the same 
uh, key requirements, um, this is what we see. Accountability, there needs to be adherence to prepare guidelines in AI data handling. So in clinical research, if there's data, if there's um, any AI processing, there needs to be adherence, there needs to be accountability. Processing limitations, minimize and legitimize legitimate data processing by AI. So just for what it needs to be processed for. Purpose specification, clearly defined lawful AI data processing objectives. So that needs to be specified. Um, if you think about further processing limitations, AI data processing compatibility with initial collection purpose, uh, information quality, got to ensure that accuracy and completeness in the AI data handling. Um, openness, we have to inform individuals on AI data collection and processing. Uh, security safeguards, uh, robust security measures to protect AI handle data, uh, data subject participation. So they need to be able to access, to rectify and delete. Um, so they need to have those rights for the individuals are clearly specified. Um, if their security compromises, it ne uh, there needs to be notification around that. Operator processing obviously need to adhere to prepare by third party AI data operators. Uh, there needs to be adequate uh, protection in AI cross-border data processing and op obtain authorization for high-risk AI data processing activities. So these are some of the critical ones. Uh, we can also ask, what about large language models? Because that's a prime, prime example now of artificial intelligence and it does have plenty of use cases in clinical research. Uh, and again, we see similar kind of things here. Maybe if I just highlight uh, specific things here, um, we need to avoid over-reliance on the LLMs. Uh, we talked about hallucinations. Um, we need to uphold clinician autonomy. Um, if we think about uh, accessibility and inclusion, we need to ensure that the large language model is accessible. The inclusion is also across uh, demographics. Um, so that's easy. So you need to look at the training data sets. If you think about how we can ensure that LLMs are used in a responsible ethical manner, uh, Again, informed consent, uh, data privacy, bias mitigation. Uh, we need to utilize techniques to identify and mitigate biases in LLMs. Um, there needs to be transparency, explainability. Um, so the models need to explain itself. Uh, those kind of things are going to be important. Um, how you actually get to a specific conclusion. Um, and the advantage of uh, these kind of large language models is that they can at least, similar to how humans would explain their rationale and thinking. Um, we can do the prompting and ask for very specific um, reasons why they came to certain conclusions and then also make sure that they don't hallucinate in, in doing that. Um, continuous monitoring is very important. Uh, we need to monitor and evaluate LLM performance continuously. Uh, we obviously need to look at the ethical guidelines, the regulatory compliance. Um, and public engagement is also important. So we need to engage with the public and stakeholders in decision making. Um, there needs to be education and training. We need to educate and train stakeholders on responsible LLM usage. Um, because it's, it's kind of a carte blanche in terms of the current ChatGPTs and BARTs. And there needs to be some education around how do you use this in a responsible way. There's obviously work being done by the providers of these technologies. But, but I do think we, we also, as users, need to be um, smart and wise in how we use it. Um, and we, uh, another thing is interdisciplinary collaboration. We need to foster collaboration among tech, legal and ethical experts. So those are just some of the things that are highlighted here. There are also, also some very interesting uh, research articles that talks about ethical and legal challenges in AI-driven healthcare. Uh, this is article 2020. Here is more a recent one. Should AI be used to support clinical ethical decision making? A systematic review of reasons. And then also uh, ethical issues in AI in medicine and healthcare. So a lot of really good stuff to read. And that concludes my talk. It's been great to be here. And uh, best wishes for the rest of the conference. Thank you.